All right, all right, all right. Greetings and salutations, gamers. My name is Kyle, also known as Gamers Weekend, and welcome back to the dark. Uh. How the hell do I even intro this? Today, we're going to be starting off our masochism in the lands between with a classic Souls challenge, archery only. It's typically not a super difficult run, but usually ends up with some interesting quirks and is a great way to learn boss patterns. Something I might as well get used to considering the pain we'll be subjecting ourselves to in the near future. Before we get into the run though, let's quickly go over the rules. For this challenge, I'm going to be limiting myself to only bows and great bows. That means every other weapon type in the game is off limits. We'll also be banning the usage of shields in this run. Not a whole lot of reasons other than this time around it feels natural to the theme of the run. The run will be done in solo only in offline mode, so no summoning cooperative phantoms or calling bell summons. As always, no major glitches or sequence breaks are allowed, and we will be going after every major boss in the game. Major boss is a bit of a weird term, but if you get an achievement from killing it, then I'll most likely be going after it. Although I did leave out Elmer, Misbegotten, and Makar this time around simply because they didn't feel necessary to the overall run for a variety of reasons. And one last thing before we get started, if you like what you see, then if you would take a second out of your day to make mine and do the YouTube thing, I'd appreciate it. And that should be about it. I hope you are all having a wonderful day. Without further ado, this is the Elden Ring Archery Only Challenge. We pick the Samurai class for our starting levels, Longbow, and additional Fire Arrows, and name our Archer Archer after Archer the Archer from the Fate series. We go ahead and grab our Golden Seed for the starting gift, and make our way to get slapped by the Grafted Scion. Upon arriving at the Lands Between, we go ahead and make a mad dash to the Game Show Gate so Melina can provide us with a new car. There's going to be a lot of running around in the early parts, so buckle up. While we're running about, we make sure to kill a couple of wolves to get runes as well as thin beast bones, which is one of the major ingredients for crafting arrows. After meeting up with Rodrigo, we immediately head back to the Agil Lake ruins to use the prank chest. This will immediately teleport us to the Celia Crystal Tunnel in Kaelid, a place that will be essential for some early game items in progress. We immediately head into town to start the Red Main painting. On our way to the location, we do some car parkour in Celia to open the path to the Plague Church and grab a Sacred Tear, and then use the nearby Jump Geyser to get to Fort Faroth. From the Fort Faroth Graves, we head north to the Minor Ur Tree and then off the nearby ledge to do some fairly tight platforming to reach the Red Main location. This painting rewards us with the Reign of Arrows Ash of War, which will be very useful early on. However, I forgot to actually sit at a grace after getting chest pranked, so I have to die from here to reset my position. Melina chooses us for Take Your Son to Work Day and we arrive at Round Table Hold. Afterwards, we head back to Caleb to grab the Lens Rice Grace for later on and head to the Third Church of America to grab the Physic and another Sacred Tear. From here, we can ride through the forest to Fort Height to grab some Blood Roses, Warrior Cookbook 6, and the Dectus Medallion. Cookbook 6 will allow us to craft arrows with the Bleed Effect, which will be a very powerful tool for our run. Next is to briefly head down the Space Mountain Elevator into Syafra Spaceland. Here we can head under the Ancestor Spirits Bridge to grab the Horn Bow, and then just a bit further into the river to grab a stack of three Smithing Stone 2s. With some of the runes we've picked up along the way, we can dump a couple levels into Intelligence to meet the requirements for the Horn Bow, which we'll be using for the early sections of this run. Next, we have the Unkillable Blacksmith, Curse You Elden Ring, equip the Reign of Arrows Ash of War. Next stop is back to the Church of Allay to pick up the Crafting Kit and head into the Limgrave Tunnels. There's almost enough smithing stone ones here to get our bow to a plus three and ends with a fairly easy boss fight against the stone digger troll. Here, we can demonstrate how we'll mainly be using the bow. Rain of Arrows only consumes one arrow in exchange for causing a large amount of that arrow type to come raining down, so one fire arrow can become many. However, it takes a while to cast and won't track a target, so will only be useful in select situations. For regular shots this run, we'll mostly be using jump shots since they replace the startup of an attack with a mobile and semi-safe jump and lets us attack a slight bit faster than a normal attack. With the Stone Digger Trolls runes, we can use the Allay Merchant to purchase regular arrows, which he thankfully has an unlimited stock of. Next up is to head into Fort Faroth and Kaelid to grab another Dectus Medallion, a high level rune, and the Radagon Sword Seal. Sword Seal won't be super useful this run, but we might as well have it just in case. 
After riding backwards through the Dragon Barrow, we arrive at the isolated Merchant Shack. The merchant here sells an unlimited supply of Serpent Arrows, which inflict a high amount of poison buildup. Another status effect to add to our repertoire. We'll go ahead and make use of these almost immediately. Time to head to the War Master's Shack to face off against the Bell Bearing Hunter. Serpent's arrows can poison him fairly easily, and we can use regular arrows as we kite him around to speed up the process. Once he's down, he'll drop the Bone Peddler's Bell Bearing, which will allow the Maiden Shop and Round Table to sell Beast Bones. Back to Kaelid to... Good god, there's so much running around in this game. Back to Kaelid, where we can purchase Nomadic Warrior's Cookbook 15 to learn how to craft rot arrows, and then scale the tower at the Impassable Grape Bridge in order to grab the Arrow Sting Talisman, which will increase the attack power of all arrows by 10%. It's almost boss time, but first we need some more materials. We can use the Mountain Pass to skip Stormvale Castle for now and head into Lyurnia. Here, we can grab additional smithing stones off the gazebos and head to the Rose Church. There are several respawning blood roses here which we can use to craft our bleed type arrows, but the run from the grace is quite significant. Thankfully, there's a stake of Merica just outside, so by grabbing blood roses and letting the Sanguine Noble kill us to reset at the stake, we can farm a lot of blood roses very quickly. We stay here for just a few minutes to build up our stock and then head to Lens Rise in Kaelid. The ball just by the grace can be baited into rolling off the cliff, and the balls in this game are living beings. Each run of this nets us 1,952 runes, making for great early game farming. Also, we'd just like to point out that the new version of the Dragon Bridge farming is in the Dragon Barrow. I see you, Miyazaki. We'll get enough runes to buff our bow up to plus 8, and then spend the rest on thin beast bones. Last stop, back to the first steps, Grace. In order to make the arrows fletched, we need flight pinions, and to get those, we need to hunt birds. Thankfully, there are several clusters of birds here which can be farmed for their pinions as well as fowl feet for later on. We will need a more efficient location later on, but for now this will be more than enough. Finally, it's about time we start taking on bosses. Margit isn't anything too special, and Bleedbone and Serpent Arrows are a great setup for him. Rain of Arrows can also do good damage when he decides to behave, although he can move out of it pretty frequently. Blood and Poison procs make this a pretty simple shootout. Before I take on Godric, I'd like to get my bow up to a plus 12 at some point, and using Godric's runes to buy the stone seems pretty efficient. But the bell bearing for smithing 4s is in Altus, and if we do that too soon, that'll cause Latena's quest to become unavailable. I'd like to do that for an easy ancient somber stone later on, so on to Lyurnia to the Lakeside Crystal Cave. The Bloodhound Knight was such a pushover, I ended the fight without a scratch. Yep, not even close. Before Latena agrees to join us, we'll need to get the Halic Tree Medallion from Old Albus, which was easy enough. From there, we headed up to the Grand Lith of Dectus to Alta's Plateau and into the Seal Tunnel to grab Smithing Stone Bell Bearing 2. Goody Rake and the Grafters I wasn't too afraid of, and for good reason. Serpent and Bloodbone arrows were the play again, and the setup worked wonders. His wind attack does deflect arrows, which is kind of neat, but not much to see here. Phase 2, he did have the ability to somewhat fight back with the dragon attacks, but nothing we couldn't handle. Even got a pretty cool looking jump shot to finish him off. With Godric's runes in hand, we head back to... Right, Halic Tree Medallion triggers Ensha. So this is a great time to bring up one of the biggest challenges of this run, human enemies. They can and will dodge almost every arrow you fire. This makes them extremely annoying to fight in most cases, and tends to get your hands sweating when it happens to be when you weren't expecting it while carrying around a large quantity of runes. Thankfully, we got the poison proc with serpent arrows and slowly ended Ensha. Now we're free to get our weapon upgrades. We have a talisman slot open from Margit, so might as well go grab the other bow-related talisman. Back above Stormville Gates, we can grab the Arrow's Reach talisman, which lowers the damage drop-off on arrows. After a quick bit of restocking, it's time to head through the Academy, and first up is Clifford the Wizard. He's fast and hard to keep pace with, but has a pretty small health pool. Serpent and Standard Arrows are the loader here for quick poison proc into normal attacks. With some well-timed jump shots, the doggo goes down. Rinala of the Full Moon is next up on the hit list. 
Having a ranged weapon, as you could imagine, made hitting the clones pretty simple, and Bleedbone Arrows helped us clean up Phase 1 pretty easily. Phase 2, on the other hand, is a much different beast. My usual advice for Renala Phase 2 is to stay as close to her as possible. When she's constantly spamming out different melee summons and you're using a longbow, this isn't exactly an easy strategy to execute. The summons did admittedly give me a bit of trouble. Although, it didn't take me long to figure out Phase 1 could be sped up by poisoning her, which persists even inside her bubble, and we finally get the timing for ranged attacks even amongst the spells and summons. Another Lord down, and the capital is now open. At this point, I decided to go ahead and get through my Weeping Peninsula shopping list. Three Sacred Tears and a Golden Seed located across the small continent capped off with a fight against an Erdtree Avatar. This thing is very easy to hit with Arrow Rain, and is very susceptible to our Serpent Arrow's poison. Not much of a fight here for the Opaline Bubble and Crimson Burst Crystal Tears. At this point, I did more restocking. In case you haven't noticed, we're going to be doing a lot of grocery shopping this run. Before heading up to the capital, I went for a quick ride around the Kalid Swamp. There are quite a few Aeonia butterflies just chilling out around here, but they don't respawn. These are used for rot bone arrows, so for now we'll need to be careful about how we use them until we get access to either more butterflies or a method to farm them. Let's hope we don't have to farm them, cause uh... Pain. Just... Pain. With bleed and rot bone arrows in hand, it's time to battle the Draconic Tree Sentinel. Interestingly enough, the fireballs make for great opportunities to land jump shots. After afflicting him with rot, we farm out bleed procs for the big damage chunks. A fight that I was honestly somewhat dreading ended up being far easier than I expected. The Draconic Tree Sentinel falls. With access to Lane Dell, it's finally time we get the main weapon of the run. From the Avenue Balcony Grace, we can make our way down to the Rune Town section and scale the rooftops for the Black Bow. This bow has some amazing quirks to it, making it a very unique longbow, but we'll talk about that in a moment. First, let's get some upgrades pumped into it. At the moment, we currently have Somber Stones 4, 3, and 1. Let's go ahead and run this thing all the way up to plus 9. First, we head back to Celia and Kaled, and along the swamp's edge into the ravine with the rockworms. Somber 5 can be picked up next to the giant head at the blue crystal. Next, we'll grab Somber 2 from EG. If you're following along at home, you can buy 1, 3, and 4 here if you still need them. For Somber 6, we'll head into Altus along the path to the Shaded Castle. Here, there is a mine that can be unlocked with stone sword keys, and inside we can get our hands on a Somber 6. For Somber 7, we can head back to the Avenue Balcony, downstairs and over the left railing into the well that takes us to the Shunning Grounds. It might take a few trips, but the hands outside of Dung Eater's Jail with a G cell drop Somber 7s on occasion. This time, it did take me a couple trips, but in almost no time at all, I claimed my Somber 7. Finally, 8 and 9 are both in Dragon Barrow. On the point where you can jump onto the Divine Tower, there's a Scarab who drops our Somber 8, and just below that in some chairs, we'll find the Somber 9. A little bit of rune farming later, and we're at a plus 9 Black Bow. Only one away from its max level, but we'll have to wait until post capital for that. The Black Bow is unique in a couple ways. It's a long bow, but shares a moveset with short bows. This means it not only has the usual jump shot, but also has quick shots on rolls and out of sprinting as well. Short bows also have quick shots when you land on the ground in addition to jump shots, so jump shot into land shot makes for a quick two arrow combo that's great on the move. I didn't figure out I had this specific combo until mountaintops, but we get there eventually. And of course, Black Bow is the only longbow with the barrage weapon art, which allows you to rapidly fire arrows in exchange for focus points. It's going to chew through our arrow reserves, but it's highly effective for both DPS and status procking. Let's give this thing a test run, shall we? Pisco's Godfrey almost always starts off combos by using his stomp, which can be easily avoided with a jump. Perfect opportunity to jump shot, although sometimes he can catch you with a follow-up if you're too close. Barrage to fire multiple arrows as he approaches, and then jump shot away if the distance is good or roll out if he's getting too close for comfort. Godfrey goes down. Before things get too crazy, let's backtrack to grab some Sacred Tears. We quickly grabbed the ones from Altus, as well as the one we missed in the Bellum Highway. I also quickly detoured back to Space Mountain for a stray golden seed, and then up to the Queen's Bed Chambers. 
Fun fact, the black knife here can almost never hit you if you jump into the half lord vessel thing. Have fun with that. Morgoth is always a fun fight, and this is no exception. We start off with Rotbone and Serpent Arrows to double stack the damage over time effects. This is a deadly combo that we'll try to use as much as we can this run. Once both effects are on and he begins to transition phase 2, we quickly swap out the Rotbone Arrows for standard ones. I would usually take bleed, but Morgoth has pretty decent resistances to bleed proc, so I'd rather just take the flat damage. It's not too long of a battle before the Omen King meets his match. A bit more restocking before grabbing the green turtle talisman and then head into the charismatic manor. Phantom Loretta is fairly weak in comparison to the capital bosses, but ranged battles against her can be a bit, uh... interesting to say the least. The main reason we want to get through the manor is to begin Rani's questline. I'm not too interested in her ending, but there is a couple major bosses involved in it as well as a farming method we'll likely need later on. First step in the quest is to take out Radon. Radon can seem intimidating, but this guy isn't too bad. Rotbone and Poison Arrows to get the double dot stacking, and then a quick switch to regular arrows to finish him off. I think if I had a way to inflict Frostbite here, I probably could have skipped phase 2, but that's not a massive concern of mine. Radon goes down with little effort. Now that Nocron Crater is open, let's go ahead and take the plunge down. First boss here is the Mimic Tier. I'm aware that you can enter the room without a weapon and it'll make the boss nearly harmless, but I wanted some semblance of a challenge. Little did I know that I was starting a long drawn out duel between archers that would last longer than almost every other boss so far. Because the Mimic Tier is a human type enemy, he's going to dodge arrows. A lot. We go through over 100 arrows in our Duel of the Archers, but finally, the Mimic Tier goes down. Just after Mimic Tier, we light all of the beacons to fight the Regal Ancestor Spirit. I didn't anticipate this thing putting up too much of a fight, so I went ahead and stuck with standard arrows. Seemed to be a pretty good idea too, because this fight didn't really have anything interesting. After grabbing the Finger Slayer Blade, I went ahead and walked backwards through the Academy Gate in Lyurnia to find the Hidden Merchant. He sells Fever's Cookbook 2, which allows us to craft Sleep Bone Arrows. Why I decided to get them now? Couldn't tell you, but they'll come in handy later. Back to the Carrion Manor to take the Teleporter Gate to Einsel River Main. After that, we head to the lake. Oh right, Noxtel is a thing. Am I the only one who forgets this is a place? Like, I swear, I forget this area exists every time I play through the game. The Baleful Shadow has a tough time dealing with arrows, especially when they inflict Scarlet Rot. He just walks up slowly, but never gets his down smash. Next we head into the lake from Ghostbusters 2. There's gotta be someone here who gets that reference, right? Which is a great place to collect more Aeonian Butterflies for Rotbone Arrows. We'll be seeing a lot more of this place later in the run. But first, we have to take on Estelle. We aren't in too much danger from most of his attacks unless we get grabbed, but his grabs are super well telegraphed and pretty easy to avoid, so we aren't in that much danger here. A load of regular arrows later, and the natural born goes down. We go ahead and finish Rani's quest because… I'm right here and might as well, and head into the Forbidden Lands. There really isn't much to see here other than the elevator to the Land of Giants. I like the look of this area, but really wish there was more to do here. Anyways, in the mountaintops of the giants, I finally figured out the landing shot, so time to go put it to use. Castle Saul is a three-step process. Run for your life, jokes on you I already have the grace, and Commander Nile. While he summons the squad, we'll use Barrage to quickly inflict him with Rot, and then kite his knights around the arena and completely ignore them while we jump shot Nile with bleed arrows. Eventually, he'll dispel the knights and enter the lightning kick phase. From here, the fight is pretty standard as we dance through and around his attacks and fire during the openings. Nile is defeated on the first try. With both Halig Tree medallions in hand, it's time to make our way to the consecrated snowfields. First stop is just under the bridge in Ordina so we can grab the black knife armor for the Elden Bling, and then up to the apostate derelict where we can complete Latena's quest. This will give us a somber ancient smithing stone, which we can take back to Hugh for one final upgrade to max out the level on our bow. Let's take this thing for a test run, shall we? Here's a bow-only dragonkin soldier of Noxtella.
Yeah, we're feeling pretty good right now. The Ordina Candle Puzzle wasn't too much of a hassle since our arrows can pretty much stunlock the Albinorix, and we make our way to the Halig Tree. There isn't any particular upgrade I'm after here, but all throughout the following area there is a large amount of Aeonian Butterflies. I'd like to avoid farming them if I can, so hopefully we can get there without much trouble. If regular Loretta ranged battles are interesting, then Halig Tree Loretta is… even more so. She's also around an endgame level boss and will output that level of damage. But as long as we play carefully, I don't think she's going to be a massive issue. I also think Rotbone plus Standard Arrows is going to be fine enough to take her out. We're going to need to restock though. A quick trip through Lake of Rot to grab whatever stray Aeonian butterflies are around and we stock back up on our Rotbone supplies. Return to the Halig Tree and Loretta goes a lot more smoothly. Yep, going good. Staying quick on our feet and choosing our shots carefully gets us a win against Loretta. We make our way all across El Fail to grab as many butterflies as we can stock up on before farming some more flight pinions for arrows. Afterwards, it's back to the snowfields for a slow and annoying fight against a dodge spamming Sanguine Noble before we can take the teleporter gate into Mogwin's Palace. The reason we want access to Mogwin's Palace is because we now have access to one of the greatest rune farming methods in the game. It could be a bit tricky to find the right angles, but by aggroing this bird by the grace, he'll run just off the ledge giving about 11k runes every kill. This can be done pretty quickly for some very efficient rune farming. Would feel pretty cheesy if I had access to this as early as Lyernia. I'm looking at you, online quest lines. I'll mostly be using the rune farm to get large quantities of thin beast bones and to max out our merchant arrows like standards and serpents, although it is available should I want a method to farm levels. Next major boss on the path is Fire Giant, and this Goliath is usually an issue during my normal runs, let alone with only archery. He has an absolutely massive health bar, so I figured that bleed procs would probably be best since bleed deals a percentage of health in this game. Turns out, even after going through all 99 Bloodbone arrows, I got less than a stellar amount of bleed procs. So with that, I tried to brute force it with Rotbone and Serpent arrows, which seemed to do pretty decently, although it would still take quite a while to chew through his massive health bar. Although, in Fire Giant's case, there's not a whole lot of ways to actually get around things. Best thing I can do at this point is play the Long Con. Start off by using Serpent Arrows and Rotbone to poison, and then mid-fight switch to Standard Arrows for the best DPS. I should bring up that in Phase 2, his hands are technically weak points, but it's hard to actually target them with a bow consistently, and constantly avoid Fire Giant's attacks. It takes a few tries and more than a few minutes, but we slowly bring down the Fire Giant. There are points when I go through the recording and ask myself why I decided to do certain things at certain points. Speaking of which, I decided to go kill Tree Sentinel and Agiel. Not sure why, but apparently that seemed to be important. For some reason. At this point we go ahead and have the revolutionary open world experience that is being hugged by Fia, and help her pass school notes with her classroom crush D before she inevitably eats his soul and moves to the deep root depths. Uh, young love. Unfortunately, that means it's time for the Vulgar Gargoyles. Not a huge fan of this boss, but thankfully we can avoid most of its major issues thanks to being an archery build. That being said, one of our greatest strengths as an archer is a wide variety of status procs, and gargoyles are immune to all of them. So this ends up becoming a lot of sprinting, dodging, and jump shotting as we do circles around them. It takes just over 5 minutes before the gargoyles fall. Once the Forever Box delivers us to Deep Root, it's a straight shot to Fia's room for the Fia's Champion's boss fight. Remember everything we brought up about human enemies before? Now we have to fight several back to back. This isn't gonna be fun. Champion number one and Roger aren't too much of an issue, but the trio is a different story. Lionel specifically is a pain with tank stats, fairly strong melee attacks, and really annoying rancors that constantly track us. Combine that with the fact that we have to deal with the other two at the same time and things are gonna get a tad annoying. It only takes two tries, but eventually, Fia's fab squad finally falls. After visiting Vertigo Towers and grabbing Death.jpg, we head back to Fia to help her fix her school project. This for some reason involves fighting a giant undead lich dragon that wields red magic lightning. You know, that thing we all had to do in school. Fortisax is pretty squishy and his attacks are pretty well telegraphed. His lightning storms also make for great opportunities to open up with Barrage. 
Fortisax doesn't take too much effort before going down. After collecting ending reskin.png, it's time to clean up Mount Gelmir to start checking off bosses on the all bosses list. First up is the full front falling far feast who wasn't much of an issue. The fight did last some time, but the boss does naturally create distance which is nice. The fight probably would have been quicker if I spent more specialty arrows on it, but Serpent and Standard were more than enough to clean up the alien bowl. After raising the Ego Bridge inside of Volcano Manor, it's time for the Golden Corral Noble. I've got a pretty good feel for his moveset after he fed me my teeth during RL1, which definitely helps. You can also get him stuck while he's rolling to get some safe damage from afar. Serpent and Standard arrows are all we need to take him out. After running through the Scaly Convention, we run into the first boss on my list that had me truly concerned, Rykard. In case you haven't noticed, the Serpent Hunter isn't a bow, and as much as I'd love to fire it with a great bow, I don't think Miyazaki would approve. Although, the next Lord of Storms clone being based around a bow would be pretty cool. Anyways, between both phases, Rykard has a total health bar of 89,613. If that number doesn't phase you, keep in mind that the final boss has roughly 35,000 health. Yeah, we've got a lot of health to get through. Thankfully, his bleed resistance isn't super large, which does help carve out chunks of his life, but we don't have enough bleed arrows to take out his entire health bar. We'll have to do our best to continuously drain him using Crimson Rotten Poison to make up for the lack of damage, and that should be enough. First try and we get pretty close to actually finishing the fight, but I took a bit too much damage and ran out of healing. Unfortunately, from here on out most of the larger bosses will require most of our arrows, which means attempts are going to be separated by sessions of farming for materials and crafting arrows. Once we're restocked about an hour later, it's time to try this again. First phase we start by rotting and poisoning, and then mid-fight we switch out for bleed bone arrows to get bleed procs. As soon as phase 1 finishes, we use the death animation to switch back to our double poison setup. Once again, Poison and Scarlet Rot are going to deal a lot of damage, and we'll switch them out as we need to refresh the damage over time. Eventually, we run out of bleed arrows and have to make a switch for standards, with still about a quarter of his health remaining. It's a long fight, but just after 10 minutes, we slay the Serpent. After having a spicy night with somebody who had a fiery case of… well, fire, we end up in Southern Oklahoma. And as much as I want to talk about this area, I've said Oklahoma to myself about 10 times now, and I swear every time I say it, it sounds weirder. Oklahoma. 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 For the Godskin duo, we bring in Sleep Bone Arrows in order to put the Apostle to sleep, and from there we can take out the Noble just like before. After he goes down, we just wait out the Apostle to respawn Noble and repeat the process. A nice and simple fight later, the duo falls on the first try. A bit more running through downtown and it's time for Malaketh. A mixture of bleed and rot bone arrows is the first loadout I try. It seems to work out okay and I almost get the kill on the first try. Unfortunately, we killed each other at the same time and because of his monologue the game considers me the loser. A couple more tries later and I go ahead and switch for serpent and rot bone. Double damage over time is just too good to pass up. Phase 1 it's pretty easy to get the clergyman stuck on pillars, and then Phase 2 Malaketh actually has a few attacks that we can punish with numerous arrows via barrage. Once we get the groove down, there isn't much more the boss can do. Malaketh goes down. With Landell now becoming the Ashen Capital, the final set of bosses is now available to us. Unfortunately, the first boss on that list is Sir Gideon Ofnir. Gideon is yet another human type NPC boss fight. Which, of course, means that he's going to be spending most of the fight dodging our arrows. The best bet in order to actually catch him is to try and hit him as he spellcasts. This has a chance to interrupt him, but doesn't always work like that. Thankfully, in a ranged fight, it's not impossibly difficult for us to dodge his attacks either, so overall this becomes a battle of attrition. One that we'll eventually win, after roughly 150 arrows and 5 minutes. I figured I'd give Godfrey a go and see how we're looking. I'm low on Crimson Rot, so I stuck with Standard and Bleed Bone arrows. Phase 1 we get through quite easily, but Cindy Lou Who showed us the true meaning of Christmas pretty quickly. I think this fight is going to be one that will want Crimson Rot. Grocery list time. After farming some flight pinions, we head back to the Consecrated Snowfield's entry area. On the invisible walkways, we can grab ourselves the Silver Scarab Talisman to help with our item discovery. Afterwards, we head to the Groveside Cave near the Church of Alay in order to farm up some Silver Fireflies in order to craft ourselves Silver Pickle Fowl Feet. 
It's time to start the dreaded Aeonia butterfly farm. Aeonian butterflies have a rare chance to be dropped from the basilisks in the Lake of Rot, a combination that I wish I never had to interact with. Thankfully, because we're farming from range, the basilisks are almost always kept out of harm's reach, which makes farming them a bit easier, and as you clear out groups of them, they'll replenish some of your flasks. Which we definitely need, because even with the regen physic on, the Lake of Rot hurts. The even more fun piece to this is that the butterfly drop is pretty rare, and we usually get around one per trip. Maybe one or two more than that if we're lucky, or sometimes even none at all. It's a pretty slow and painful process, but at least the runes that the basilisk drop can pay off the massive amount of arrows it takes to farm them. As things are looking right now, I'm a bit concerned for our damage output. We're not exactly lacking thanks to status effects carrying us, but I'd like to get a bit more consistent damage. My first idea was the blue dancer charm from Limgrave, but overall it's not entirely worth the effort it takes to get the full effects out of the charm. We would basically have to be naked for it to have any major impact. Which led me to the Lux runes to take out Gillica and grab the Ritual Sword Talisman, a much better use of our time. This talisman makes it so whenever we're at full health, we get a small boost to our weapon damage, around 10%. This may seem like a small upgrade, but in boss fights where we're going through 100 plus arrows, it'll definitely make a big difference. We head back to the Church of America and Altus to take out Eleanor for the Blood Tear, and then back to the Carrion Manor to visit Pitya's body. His bell bearing will let us Glintstone Cookbook 7, which will allow us to craft Frostbone Arrows for the sweet frostbite effect we've been missing. These take Rhymed Crystal Buds, but with access to snowfields, it'll be easy to farm them. Simply run from the Grace at Ordina to the large tree and grab everything at its base. Makes for around 20-ish buds per run. With a wide variety of arrows and a bit more optimized talismans, our build is looking like it's finally starting to reach its apex. With that in mind, I think it's about time we take inventory on what's left in the run. Godfrey and Radabeast are the last two necessary to get the win on the challenge, but if we want that all major bosses badge, then we still have Melania, Moog, and Placidusax left in our run. Five bosses left in our path and it's a dangerous lineup, but we've got a good amount of options and resources at our disposal, so I'm feeling pretty good going into this. I think it's time we hunt some super bosses. First on our list is the Blade of Mikla herself, Melania. To go over every mechanic in Melania's fight could be its own video, but to make it short, Melania has a few different modes she can enter based on how the fight is playing out. If she gets interrupted during certain attacks, she'll enter a sort of passive state where she won't be able to dodge attacks. Typically, she'll be in either an aggressive stance where she'll slowly approach and dodge arrows, and then her final mode is when she wants to go for the waterfowl dance. From a distance, it's fairly easy to tell what kind of attacks she'll go for based on her movement patterns. Being at a distance also helps with dealing with the Waterfowl Dance, as usually she's out of range for parts 1 and 2, and then part 3 is easy to avoid. Sometimes she's within striking range for part 2, but that one is easy enough to dodge with a single roll. For arrow types, we're alternating between Standard, Bleedbone, and Frostbone arrows. Frostbite proc for the chunk of damage, and then use the Frost to enhance the damage of our other arrow types. Phase 1 usually is mainly Standard arrows, and just before Phase 2, I'll swap to Bleed. In Phase 2, her Scarlet Aeonia leaves her vulnerable for several seconds, which lets us rapidly stack Frostbite using Barrage. Ideally, we want Melania to be stuck in her aggressive stance when she continually runs at us, as she's not likely to dodge and we can even chain together headshots when the elevation is right. Some of her other attacks like the Flying Dash are nice, but ultimately we pray for that Scarlet Aeonia to get those extended periods of Barrage. It took three tries to make it to Melania's second phase, and every try after that, we saw the Rock Goddess. It took a total of eight attempts, ten minutes, and three seconds before we slay the Scarlet Goddess. Next up is Moog. He seems threatening, but in actuality, Bo only may be one of his greatest weaknesses. In phase one, he struggles with ranged attacks, as he struggles to cross long distances. During the knee heal chant, we have plenty of time to barrage him with arrows, and for types this time around, we've brought in bleed and frostbite once again. Ultimately, this fight boiled down to kiting the Lord of Blood back and forth across the arena until he finally submitted to the aggressive acupuncture. The Blood Omen goes down on the first try. The 
The Dragon Lord is the final optional boss on the chopping block. This one's a bit of a mixed bag. He gives us plenty of time to actually attack, and we get several arrows off at a time. However, his resistances are absolutely massive. It's going to be difficult even with all the extra time to proc status. Thankfully, his biggest weakness happens to be physical piercing damage, so standard arrows are actually going to be king here. In our secondary slot, we'll go ahead and take the Frostbone arrows for the added damage that Frostbite gives us. He's definitely a tricky fight to manage, but it only takes 4 tries before Placidus X falls. Time to head for the finish, so let's clean up Godfrey. If there's anything that's going to melt this boss, it's going to be double damage over time. Rotbone and Serpent Arrows work wonders on the first Elden Lord, and while Cindy Lou Who gives us a bit of a fight, it's only a matter of time before he gives in. The first Elden Lord is finished. And then we were down to one final challenge, Radagon and the Elden Beast. Radagon alone gave us plenty of issues immediately. His resistances are pretty significant, but they're only one of many problems we'll be facing here. His ability to deflect projectiles can almost entirely nullify our attacks, and his ability to rush us down is incredible. Keeping our distance against him is going to be next to impossible. That's not even to mention the sheer amount of damage this boss does. It's not necessarily that every attack hits like a truck, but there are so many smaller hits that he weaves between the large attacks that are tricky to avoid and call out. The damage he deals adds up very rapidly, so our flask count is definitely a concern. And that's not taking the Elden Beast in Phase 2 into consideration. Elden Beast overall has some easier attacks to avoid, but the attacks can be extremely punishing should you mess up. Some of Elden Beast's attacks are almost straight up guarantees to be damaged by, like the Elden Stars. At first, Rotbone and Serpent Arrows seemed like they were going to be the play for Radagon, but I decided to retire the Rot Arrows after a while. Getting done with Radagon as quickly as possible should be the play here, and Rot Arrows take far too long to even begin the damage tick. Serpent Arrows on the other hand deal much more poison buildup and can actually begin the proc at a reasonable time. Eventually, I settled on Fire Arrows. Turns out Radagon has slightly less fire resistance than most other types, which we'll be using to burn through his bar. Elden Beast is completely immune to status effects and is fairly resistant to most of the elements, so we'll be relying on standard arrows to finish the job here. To help with Radagon's holy damage, we get our hands on the Halig Drake Medallion plus two. We also thankfully find a better spot at the Lyurnia Shore to farm the Flight Pinions, which will help us out on arrows between attempts. A few more failed attempts later and we upgrade the armor set. Malekith armor with Lionel Helm not only looks pretty stylish, but also gives some pretty good defenses. This time we're getting much closer, actually almost beating Elden Beast. We need just a bit more something to help get us through this fight. Using the teleport gate in the Weeping Peninsula, we can make our way to the chest in Landell that holds the Blessed Dew Talisman, a talisman that very slowly regenerates our health over time. Mixed with a Ruin Arc that's popped with Godric's Great Ruin, we hopefully have enough to get through the fight. First phase goes pretty smoothly, and we end up finally making it to the Elden Beast with 8 Crimson Flasks. This is definitely a number we can work with. It ends up being a battle that depletes us of every single one of those flasks, but we finally find the fight we were looking for. 10 minutes and 54 seconds later, the Elden Beast is slain. And with that win, we have begun the Age of the Duskborn. An ending that marks that we have defeated Elden Ring with only archery. That was actually a bit more fun than I was expecting it to be. There are points when I'd say that archery almost feels like a viable build, but then there were points when the game absolutely bullied us for a choice. Overall though, I'd say this was a pretty fun challenge to take on. Definitely helped out a lot to learn some of the movesets I wasn't quite familiar with. But now, we can finally put a wrap on this challenge and prepare for the ones in the coming future. Thankfully, depending on when this video comes out, the next challenge may already be done. We've been doing an RL1 run of the game live here on the channel, and it's been a blast experiencing it with you guys. For those of you who struggle to watch through long multi-hour VODs, then don't fear, because next time we'll be covering the Rune Level 1 playthrough. In the meantime, if you guys have a challenge idea you'd like to see either as a full video, a live stream, or both, then let me know either in the comments or in the suggestions channel of my Discord. I always enjoy seeing the wacky and intuitive things you guys come up with, so feel free to give me a shout. Lastly, if you made it all the way to the end, then I wanted to give you a special thank you. 
Even just writing the script, I can tell that this journey has been a longer one than we're used to, so thank you so much for giving me the honor of getting to spend the time with all of you. But that's going to do it for me today. If you enjoyed the video, then please give it a thumbs up, bop that subscribe button, and ring tingling that little bell to be notified whenever I drop another video. You can also join the Discord, link is in the description below to come chat with me and hang out with the rest of the community. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you gamers on the flip side. Later!